Hi everyone, it's Michael Forrester from ConeCloud, and today I want to talk about the latest AWS developments for April 2023 that could change how you use Amazon Web Services. AWS is constantly growing, so staying updated with the latest changes is important because if you don't, you may miss out on great opportunities to optimize, to save money, to use new services, and so much more. In this April 2023 video, I'm going to review the top eight service highlights and releases and tips for ensuring that these new features translate into your success. So click subscribe now as we will publish these tidbits on AWS at least monthly, highlighting the most important service changes and new releases. Let's get started. Hi, welcome. All right, so it's April 2023. And let's talk about the most significant changes that have happened in the last like month or so. So one thing to point out that's new to this format is that I did add the sources for where I was deriving the actual releases. So you can look for yourself. Now, most of what I'm going to choose is from every week, I'm going to choose two things that I think make the most sense, but you might look at the sources because you might want to just see in the entirety of everything that got released in AWS. I mean, I totally get that. Just to highlight that really quickly, if I click on week one, it should show basically the weekend review for April 3rd, and then it'll show you this for April 10th, and then April 17th, and then April 24th. So those four links at the very bottom that show sources, those lead you directly to the public pages for AWS. What I did is curated what I thought was gonna be the most significant for any DevOps role that you were in. So first and foremost, let's talk about guard duty. So Amazon guard duty is a vulnerability scanner. It is a security service. It's been around for quite some time. And Guard Duty supports a variety of different security scans, but mainly what it's looking for is common vulnerabilities in things like EC2 virtual machines, S3 buckets, EBS volumes. I think there was just a preview for Lambda that came out last week. Now it works on two levels. Guard Duty scans across the network and checks the virtual machine for open ports and vulnerabilities. You can also run an agent inside the virtual machine and it will actually check for weird software releases and bugs based on known public vulnerabilities, also known as CVEs, right? And so Guard Duty now supports Amazon EKS, so it supports runtimes for the containers. Now, let's be clear about this. Guard Duty supported the control plane of the Elastic Kubernetes service for a while now. But what this is, they've added actually now support for the container runtimes. So if we click into this, just take a quick look. Notice that this is set for March 30th because it caught the previous month a little bit. But Guard Duty launched six years ago. And so you can see that it talks to CloudTrail and that it protects S3 and it protects EKS, the control plane, has some EBS scans, it has RTS protection in particular. So what they did is they made it so that it now has runtime monitoring. So it can actually detect runtime threats in running containers to protect your EKS clusters. So it uses an EKS add-on that adds visibility into the individual container runtimes, such as like file access, process execution, and any kind of network connections that are initiated. So it can now basically tell you if there are specific containers within your Kubernetes clusters that are compromised, especially if someone tries to escalate privileges inside of cluster, and especially if it's on an EC2 host. I don't think it supports Fargate just yet. That's the first one. The second release of significance is that now AWS Cloud Shell now has a console toolbar. If you log into the web interface for AWS, you can now log in and you can actually use the web interface and now get a command line interface inside the browser. Now, if you want to see what this looks like, we're actually going to go to the source for this. So if I go back to that link that I was just looking at and you scroll down, you can actually see here's a great picture of the shell being implemented. So you can see here that the console's at the top and then now you've got a command line shell, which you can add multiple tabs for, that will actually allow you to type in commands and manipulate the console. So you can use the console for verification and you can manipulate with the CLI, with the command line interface. This is significant because the console is great at visual verification and learning things about AWS. But most of the time when we scale, we're actually using either the command line or we're using like a third party tool like Terraform, for example. And so, here you get the best of both worlds because you get this shell that like sits right in your browser. So you don't need to initiate a special virtual machine for it. It has any permissions that you have according to your login and you can modify that. 
and you can verify in the console and you can shrink it, expand it as you need to in order to be able to manipulate everything. So that's great because it's great for learning. Anything that eases the setup of these things is awesome. Like it makes it easier. So if we go back, that's the second item and look at number three. Number three is that the AWS service catalog, which is an underrated service. It's a way of packaging AWS services and offering to them to your internal clients. So think of it as almost like a developer portal, but it's really a service portal, which is why it's called the service catalog. Now the service catalog previously required you to write cloud formation and you would then cloud formation would build the resources based on and the services based on what your clients asked of it. So for example, let's say you had cloud formation templates for EC2 virtual machines and you had it an offering that said a client from your internal business can come in, log into your website, go to service catalog and say, I want three virtual machines. Service catalog is a portal that allows that to happen so that you can offer your AWS services as internal products and you get to control them the way the company wants to control them. Now, previously this only supported CloudFormation. Now it supports Terraform. So you can actually invoke Terraform and I believe you have to use the Terraform engine by AWS in order to support this but it basically allows you to offer Terraform templates as products that your internal developers, internal operations folks, internal people can use using the service catalogs interface. Cool, actually. Number four, this is a big one. So make sure you open up your senses and you take this one in because this is gonna change a lot of things. Number four is that Amazon S3 is now enforcing two new security best practices. Previously, there was a section of the S3 interface that said, let's allow or block all public access. Think of this as an extra firewall that wrapped around your S3 service or your S3 bucket that you had to disable if you wanted someone to come in from the internet and talk to your S3 bucket. You had to disable that, right? Now, it wasn't necessarily on by default. AWS is changing that so any new buckets that are created automatically they are blocked from public internet access which is nice because how many times do we see this actually in all of the local news outlets now the second thing that changed is that now access control lists which are still necessary for certain use cases with S3 now that's being disabled by default which is interesting because if you expect your buckets to be publicly available by default and you try to enable things like a website or whatever, you now in your Terraform templates and in your cloud formation, you have to specify that you want to enable or disable block public access. And you have to specify that you want to enable access control lists. So some of your Terraform, some of your cloud formation may break as a result of this. And you're probably already seeing it because it's being implemented out account by account so just know that if you get start getting weird errors around S3 whenever you try to provision a new bucket and you get like weird permission errors or some kind of ambiguous permission error, it might be because Amazon just rolled out an automatic disabling of access control list and they automatically enabled the block all public access firewall. So if you're running into weird provisioning issues with S3 that you've done dozens of times before, check to see that you are enabling and disabling ACLs and the block public access as necessary. That's number four. All right, number five, another big one. And this one, I, they have a great webpage for, so I'm gonna show this, is that Amazon Code Whisperer is now like generally available. Now, if you don't know what Code Whisperer is, I'm gonna show you this, and I think it's actually pretty cool. So notice here that there's just a string of comments going across the screen right now. It's just a comment about I want you to parse the CV a CSV string of songs and return the, the list, right? Ignore the line starting with pound because those are comments, right? Notice that when they type that, Code Whisperer just filled in the function. That's what Code Whisperer does. You type in what you want. It could be a comment or something else. You could actually start the function if you wanted to. But if you type in a comment about what you want, it's going to try to fill it out for you. Now, how accurate is this? For very simple things, it's 100% accurate. For more complex functions, I'm finding that it's a little, a lot less accurate, like maybe 70 or 80% there, but let's be clear. This is gonna save you work from writing in the blank page. Still keep an eye on it because it's a work in progress, but it's amazing. It can really save you time when you're writing 
functions, class, whatever it is that you're doing in code, this can help you out quite a bit, okay? That is now available for everybody. So this has hit general availability. This is no longer in preview. And there is, by the way, a professional version that you can pay for, but the individual version is free to use. So yeah, that's amazing. So if you use VS Code or any other tool that has the AWS Kit plugin, you can enable Code Whisperer inside of your IDE, your integrated developer environment, and get it to help you write functions. All right, that was number five. Let's get to number six. So number six, and I think this is significant, is that there's now been updates to the AWS Well Architected Framework. So this is a series of papers that cover six pillars. The pillars are security, operational excellence, reliability, performance efficiency, cost optimization, and sustainability. Now, sustainability is the new pillar added to this whole thing. And the idea here around security, reliability, and et cetera, is that AWS was previously offering descriptive and some prescriptive guidance about how to navigate cloud and these six pillars. So how to navigate cloud and operational excellence, how to navigate cloud and security, how to navigate cloud and reliability. What they've done is they've rewritten the papers that have been used for this and they are even more prescriptive and they've been updated with modern services. So like, I don't even know that guard duty was in there in any kind of strength or elastic disaster recovery wasn't listed in there, right? Which is the old cloud indoor product that they recently converted. So all of that has been updated and that's significant because while DevOps engineers per se are not necessarily super focused on architecture, we do participate in architecture conversations, but more importantly, especially around security and operational excellence, there's now very strong, like much stronger prescriptive guidance about how to navigate those pillars. Worth a read, at least the security and operational excellence pillars for my DevOps brethren, brothers and sisters out there, okay? Now, that was number six. So number seven is that Amazon Code Catalyst is now generally available. Just Code Whisperer became generally available. Code Catalyst is now generally available. You might say to yourself, Michael, what is Code Catalyst? Think of that you wanna create an entire CI CD pipeline where you don't wanna to have to orchestrate all the pieces together, right? Code Catalyst does all of that for you, right? And it now supports like Amazon's Gravitron processors. It supports more deployment environments, more tooling in GitHub, for example. And what this allows you to do is allows you to source from repo to delivery without having to put all the pieces together. So think of Code Catalyst as a unified software development service that puts all these pieces together and allows you to make pipelines in a much easier fashion. Check it out if you're looking for something where you don't have to string all these things together to go from code commit over to using code build to you know, code pipeline to call code build and then call code artifact, none of that. This simplifies that greatly. So look at Code Catalyst if you're looking to simplify that CI CD process. That's number seven. Last but not least, number eight is that we can now create CI CD pipelines and dot net using CDK pipelines. But this one is a little bit more of a blog because I love to give you actionable things. And so this DevOps blog is actually going to show you how to use the CDK, the cloud development kit, which if you're not familiar with that, it's an open source framework to define cloud infrastructure. It is very much an AWS product, but like they offer it as an open source product for other people to contribute and use. This allows you to be, by the way, to create a CI CD pipeline using the .NET framework. Because as you may remember, you know, .NET, you have to compile and release like an actual, in a sense, binary, if you will. And so that compilation step is not present in a lot of CI CD pipelines that are say using like Python or JavaScript. And so this whole thing is gonna walk you through the process of using the CDK to deploy a CI CD pipeline using .NET. And you can see here's the architecture, here's the steps. Here in this particular case, it's running through code build, using a CDK pipeline, using CloudFormation, and publishing everything out, in this case, to Lambda. So, and again, reminder that the sources for all of this are at the bottom of the sheet, but that's it for the highlights in April, 2023. Hit like if you love this video, leave comments if you wanna let us know how you can change, improve, or do things better. I'm Michael Forrester. I'll see you over at CodeCloud.